You ready to rock? You ready? You happy? Ready to rock? I'm good to go, yeah. You are, cool. I thought you said, have you been to Iraq? No. <laughs> no, mate. It's the accent. Is, yeah, have you been to Iraq? Yeah. Is, I'm the presenter and I'm the one with the worst diction. That's what happens when you got offices on, isn't it? Um, what were we on about then? We were on about... Uh, Bootnecks. Bootnecks, yes. So I started... I, well, in fact, well... <laughs> was a good start, mate. I started off the podcast and thought, right, because I'm a power edge, thought, right, I've got to be really conscious. Given my my network is predominantly X reg, I thought I've got to be really careful of not getting loads of reg blocks on because it'll become the reg show and it'll, it'll, it'll like it'll just not the soul, not the word. Uh, you know, people you know people who aren't reg, they're fucking oh, they're not really reg blocks, right? And now what happens is it's like all I think over half of the podcast. We're on number fifty today, by the way. Congratulations, yeah. number fifty. Well, yeah. Congratulations, <laughs> that, that's pretty impressive. Good stamina. Yeah. There. <laughs> I know, yeah, especially with uh, especially as I was just saying with all the flipping bootnecks. Yeah, loads of bootnecks. I don't know how it's happened, but so James Glancy is it Jim or James? So in the military, I'm known as Jim Glancy. Right, let's put Civvy, it. Pull Civvy, Civvy, Civvy Street, Wrong. James Glancy. Is it? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Professional drills. He's got it squared away. There you go, Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Right, okay. Cool. See. Um, Jim. Jim. James. So you don't mind Jim? No. Yeah. No, Jim or James is fine. Right. Jim Glancy, ex flipping boot neck officer. I was. Yeah. Join up as an officer. I did. Did you? Why are you saying like that? You don't sound very happy about no, it. No, in two thousand and one. It just seems like a long time ago. When you talk, when you talk about back in the beginning, it's like I went to a school reunion the other day, mm-hmm. and I didn't think anybody looked that much older until I looked through the photos of the yearbook, and then it's like that was coming up for twenty years ago. That's worrying. When were uh, how old are you? I'm thirty five. It wasn't twenty years ago, but oh it's God, you're younger than me. Really? Yes. Yeah, you're not wearing it well though. Uh, I know, mate. I had a hard <laughs> pit run in the valley, isn't I? Um... <laughs> Cheers, buddy. Appreciate it. Number 15, you've ruined it already. Well, I know because the other, you know, when we first started talking, you immediately, the first thing I got was shit for being a bootneck. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, well, here we go. Parachute <laughs> regiment. Yeah. That's, well, no, I've been all right, mate. I've been, been fine with you guys. No. I have to be because so many of you in the booty commas are friends now. I, yeah, exactly. I get, I get, I get more old. Um, mate, I was. Going to introduce me. No. No, 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 I do that. No, 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 I do that after this. Oh, right. That's okay. done. So imagine the introduction has just been done. Oh, right, okay. I record it separately when you're not listening. Ah, uh, okay. See? <laughs> There's reasons for that. So, no, every, I've explained. I've already explained at this point your background. I outlined it. Uh, one of the things, so obviously you, you were, you got into diving when you were in. And the only reason I know that, I'm assuming it was when you were in. No, it wasn't when you were in. It wasn't when you were in. You learned to dive off it. So I've done my research for this one. You learned to dive. A US Navy SEAL taught you when you were a child, right? Yeah. Tell, can you tell me about that? Yeah, it was, it was a funny time. But, um, I was 12, 13 years old and a right tear away. And you know, I guess nowadays kids would be diagnosed with ADHD, ADD, and they try and put young boys in a box and feed them Ritalin and make them not be active kids. My parents encouraged me just to get out in the garden, go and do activities. I was just, whether it was mountain biking, running, doing cross country, end up joining the cadets. I think my mum just had had enough of me, and we're on a holiday, and they saw the opportunity for me to learn to dive. Basically, let's get him underwater. That will shut him up. <laughs> <laughs> so my dad took me, and I th- at that time, Paddy Open Water Course, you had to be thirteen t- to learn, and. I was 13 on that holiday, so I did all the theory. On on my 13th birthday, I was underwater. And I remember when we we were sort of trans, transiting out to the dive site, the uh, dive master or the instructor is mega experienced, wiry old guy, done and it's done around 10,000 dives, something completely ludicrous, spent a life underwater. But it turned out he had been in the Navy SEALs. And I hadn't long uh, since read the Andy McNabb books and all those Bravo to Zero type of series. So seeing this guy le- teaching me to dive and just being so competent, I just thought, oh, one day I want to be uh, on a dive boat and be able to say I was a British Navy SEAL and then everyone will just shut up. 
and that really was the sort of inspiration to to um go into the armed forces i've been reading the books i had my other course of action in life was to actually go to rada the royal academy of dramatic arts i want to be an actor right it sounds ridiculous <laughs> things come together in my head now but then i ended up um really enjoying the cadets and getting recruited into join the army um, my dad was in the powers actually would you oh, believe in really? so yeah i was my I was on my way to join the powers but it, that was a pivotal point doing an, an adventurous sport like diving made me think actually i want to dive and on those first few dives there were loads of bull sharks reef sharks and i was completely in awe so when i went home the two things i did was uh play more guns in the garden and build camps and buy a load of shark books <laughs> and i just became completely nuts about the underwater world and about the military military world that's well that's how i came to know or read about that the way you learn to dive and then completely, completely forgot it was when i was i was watching i was watching uh <laughs> that that thing he did for shark week was it last year yes where you went and tried tried to spend well he did he spent nigh on what was it 43 hours jumping in the water with you and, and your mate He's American ex-military, right? No. Australian, Australian ex-military, yeah. but also an amputee, but a double amputee, but a double amputee because the shark, more or less, tried to bite him in half. And then you and him, I don't know, I don't know what he was thinking. Well, he's probably, only been caught once, thought, well, spent, the, <laughs> go on. Well, the guy we're talking about is Paul de Gelder, and okay. he was an Australian Navy clearance diver. He was in Sydney Harbour 10 years ago doing a diving course and he was on his way back onto on the to the boat swimming on his back and gets hit hard on the side he didn't have a clue what it was until he looked down and saw the eye of a bull shark and the teeth ripping at his hand and his leg and it took uh, both of them off took his leg off and took his hand off and he was lucky to be alive if he hadn't been in Sydney Harbour close to a Royal One medical facility. They were able to get him out, stem the blood flow, get in there and operate on him really quickly. Um, probably wouldn't have survived that. But Paul's an, he's an amazing character. He was um, in the Aussie, Aussie Airborne, then a clearance diver. So, you know, he was hardcore. But that pretty much uh, brought his military career to an end. And... He ended up becoming an ambassador for shark conservation, which is where he got, he got noticed by Discovery Channel and has become a host. You'd on. think you want to kill them all. Well, and this is the greatest story when you do get people that have generally what you could see as a negative interaction with wildlife. And that, you know, that hasn't worked out particularly positive. But he has recognized that the shark wasn't targeting him. They only hit him once. Didn't like the taste of him. Obviously caused a lot of damage. And become an ambassador conservationist and is now a regular host on shark week and you'll see him last year did hosted three shows with you know with a-list celebrities he's converting a lot of people he does talks all around the Aust australia and the usa and he's inspiring people um, of all ages to take more interest in the ocean and sharks so yeah he's an inspiration with me uh, to me so i am um, i got put together with him by a production company a british one called big wave who do a lot of uh, natural history productions and um, the idea come about in that I, um, I've t always taken an interest in the natural world and have been just seriously pissed off by o uh, overfishing from all nations. Everyone wants to blame the Chinese, but we are just as bad. Really? Oh, you, we, and and I, can, I can talk about that more later if we talk about conservation. But um, it, sharks get hammered for their fins, for their meat, for their oil. And I, and I thought, how can we best sort of convey this message to the general public without um, boring them to tears? So the story that was really that was really interested me was the USS Indianapolis. I don't have you heard. About I've heard this? of it. I've heard of the ship. So the Indianapolis uh, in 1945 was carrying uh, U.S. Navy uh, sailors. Um, it was carrying actually the um, atomic bomb that. Uh, delivered the bomb. It delivered the bomb that uh, dropped on Hiroshima. On its way back, it got sunk by a Japanese uh, U-boat. So a bit of karma there. Okay. And the survivors who were all in the sea, uh, I think there's 700 jumped into the sea. A good number got killed by sharks, which are believed to be oceanic white tips. A lot more died of dehydration, hunger, drowning. 
Uh, and the ones that were picked up uh, told a harrowing tale of how the bodies were getting picked off by the oceanic white tips. The white tips what you dive with last year. Exactly. Right? Yeah. But back then, back in 1945, there literally would have been, well, it had been a healthy marine ecosystem around the world. The, the oceans would have been full of everything that you can imagine from a Blue Planet film, but also millions, billions of sharks. That's before industrial fishing. So last year, well, the year before last, um, Paul Allen, the founder of uh, Microsoft, um, he does it. He used to do this deep sea diving stuff before he uh, before he died of cancer, and he found USS Indianapolis. So he got the GPS coordinates. So I came up with this idea and pitched it to a production company and Discovery Channel. Why don't we just put some people in the water for a couple of days at that, that GPS coordinates and see how few sharks turn up and and show it as a conservation experiment that uh, we've killed so many. And Discovery Channel with the production company took the idea and like, <laughs> hey, that's a great idea. Would you do this? And I was like, yeah, I think so. And they and they said, okay, we'll 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 contract you to do it, but you, we need to do it in a marine protected area because we need there to be a shit ton of sharks. Otherwise, there's no show. And I was like, whoa, okay, I hadn't really thought this one through. So you can't prove the point. So we. That we proved the point that we couldn't do it anywhere else because there just isn't the density of sharks right, to make right, a show, right. and they make that in it. Yeah. But um, I got they rang Paul de Gaulle and said, "Hey, you've had a shark attack. Why don't you? Would you like? Do you fancy hanging around in the water with like some crazy <laughs> British guy?" And he said, "Yes." So we made this show, and it was the second highest viewed show on Shark Week last year. Um, so we've done it again. Um, uh, have you? What you done it again now, <laughs> mate? I was watching it, and I because I, I watched it with the missus. We sat there and went, see this? And this is going, what are they doing? What are they doing is mental. What I was expecting was like, you jump in the water and there'd be some cage or you'd literally be, you'd just be, you know, you think this, no offense to you, Jeff. You're thinking, this is too crazy for it to be real. And then, no, 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 it's, it's real. Like, oh, you can see all the camera footage and then the flipping shots kind of out. It was, it was, uh, why have you done it again, mate? <laughs> so the o oceanic white tips are amazing, and the, but the ones in the Bahamas seem to be conditioned to um, commercial diving, so they're not not particularly aggressive. I'm not sure if they'd respond in the same way they did to us um, elsewhere, but also at night time we did have protection. We had this net that we got into, and and a, a shark won't breach a, a barrier, however thin it is. They don't want to get entangled if they can see it. So it was very, it had this obvious net, not a cage, but a net, and that worked. The worst thing about it was just being in the water, bored and cold. I cannot explain. Well, you could just imagine the work, the longest ambush you've been in, the rain. It's just way worse than that because you can't sleep on the butt oh, of your weapon. Yeah. You can't. You cannot get your head down because you keep getting splashed in the face. By night two, we were just absolutely done with it. We're like, what are we doing? This is just ridiculous. <laughs> you should have thought that before, and you know, buoyancy aids. Yeah, at night time. So we were wearing these small uh, buoyancy devices. Um, but what we needed to, because we, we did have masks, you, we would not have done it without needing to see what was below us. Um, you don't want to have a buoyancy device inflated and sit there with your head up because they're designed to keep your airway open. Yeah. But then you can't see what's under you. So, so because I saw a couple of clips of you having to defend yourselves yeah. where the sharks are coming in. And you just, I say just, What's the secret? Hit them on the nose. No, you don't try not to hit them. Is actually a secret. guide them. So that that is very old school sort of second one war. Hitting any, any if if I hit you, if you're walking past me on the tube, you're gonna get annoyed because you're a bit too close. You know, if you walk up to somebody in a bar and they just hit you, you're gonna get annoyed. And at the animal animals, uh, they are, um, they have, uh, they have a. Uh, a similar sort of communication system as us, where if you're aggressive to them, they don't take that too well. And right. these guys have pretty decent attacking and defensive mechanisms. So you you hit it, it's gonna either get seriously pissed off, or if it feels it's it's it can't win, it's gonna it's gonna leave. But you don't want to take that chance. So it's just an aggressive or soft. You guide them away, and their nose is so sensitive. If you touch it, it causes them to flinch, and you can push them away. So and and actually they they won't they'll only bump you when they know you can't see them so they always come up behind you they are ambush oh. predators that's the worst thing about it that night time is horrendous which is why we had this pen because we would have got we would have got scrammed we got to eaten at night how do they know how do they know where our eyes are 
I have found, you know, I have found it amazing uh, in my conservation work with veterans for wildlife. Being out in the bush, being out in the jungle and at sea, just how intelligent uh, wildlife and the animal kingdom is. They know all your sensory systems. They understand aggression. They understand weakness. They know when you're weak and tired, especially predators, that it is absolutely inbuilt. It's instinctive. Even if they haven't seen a human before, they seem to understand weakness. Now, sharks have an electromagnetic sensory system. Um, they have um, in their nose and along the lateral lines of their, their bodies. and So in their snouts, they can sense uh, electric pulses of fish, but they can also sense that of you. So they, they, they are building up a picture like a submarine or a fighter jet of what you are, what you're doing. You know, what sort of state you're in well, we don't have anything like that yeah that is free way more advanced than we think so but in, in in that in that respect um i learned so much about predators in the water um and just how vulnerable we are we are not meant to be in the water long term we're in their world which is why i want to promote um respect and uh coexistence with all the species in the ocean because we can't just keep plundering them at the rate we are with uh, commercial and industrial fishing practices. And this is where you sort of the conservation environmental aspect is, is born out of, is it really? Yeah. Because so, you hugely, you feel very strongly about it, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, the, most people are now aware of it with campaigns that have emerged as a result of Blue Planet 2, the plastics campaign. And, um, but I think, and the younger generations are far more eco environmentally aware. I left the military in 2014 now, and I think you've had loads of really interesting people on this podcast, and I'm sure, uh, I imagine one of the common themes is how difficult it is to leave and transition. And I found that myself, and I tried, I started a, a risk management business called Another Day, which is still going. But I, what I didn't find in that is the fulfillment of having a mission, something that I was absolutely committed to. Uh, and it also, in a... So the security risk management financial world a lot of these uh, corporate jobs are very much desk jobs and having spent my life outdoors on operations being taught a variety of skills i just couldn't put, put myself in a in an office for life especially you know somebody of adhd it's just i'm going crazy i'm wanting to skydive out the top top window of the building or put base go base jumping and you know that is not conducive to the the nine to five environment so I got I, I got introduced to Veterans for Wildlife, um, set up by two, well, set up by former Royal Marine, as, as many good Obviously. things are. <laughs> and um, I went out to South Africa and ran a training course with, with some other guys from Veterans for Wildlife and suddenly realized, wow, there is so much to do, but it is the most fulfilling thing I've done since I left the military. So I committed myself to working with the charity and I'm now a director uh, of special projects and um, looking after the weird and wonderful things that w we get involved with in some of the more dangerous parts of Africa and also we've got a, a new game reserve project where we're, we're building a game reserve with the Zulus in KwaZulu really? Natal yeah so that has given me just a massive sense of purpose and the more I have educated myself about conservation and environmental issues I realize it's not a fringe thing that lunatics read about or write about in the guardian this is a real the real issue of our time and uh something that isn't isn't going to go away unless we make more people aware of it mm -hmm. it's interesting you say um <clears throat> well, just going back a step sorry uh the that sense of purpose that is a common thing it's sort of the thing i i realize and i think it, it it's also something I, i've struggled to uh, ex explain in a way explain away as saying it's it's achievable basically saying you know you, ideally you want to be doing what you enjoy right now how many people get the opportunity you don't you don't now and it's and people who, who are in a job where you know they can't they can't get out they haven't got any other options or they don't see it whatever how do you get that sense of purpose sense of fulfillment because what it is is it's it, it's been a part of a team and you all have a you all have a common mindset and in the in the mission you're achieving is is a critical thing that needs to be done for the greater good when you're in the military it's take an enemy position or or it could be a humanitarian kind of thing def um you know a defensive operation mission to go and help people get back to their lives, build a school whatever right 
Exactly. How do you do that in Civvy Street? Now, and also it's one of those things you don't realise is what the solution is to what you you think you're missing or where you're unhappy. Um, and I it's, I sort of stumbled across that fulfilment in I think I went looking for it with the podcast. I think I think I went looking for it with the podcast that that'll be because I was you know as you did sort of found it our transition that was the reason why what what we're doing i need to be doing something meaningful i think i tried to achieve it with a podcast but it was sort of almost artificial um with the podcast meaning conversation like this and helping other veterans out and just listening and learning something hopefully from other people's yeah. experiences but it didn't happen you know it i didn't i, was, I wasn't getting that sense of fulfillment straight away and almost because it was a sort of trying to force it upon myself, on myself um i do get it now but not back then uh, but one of the things i do now is part of my job within marsat is i work i'm with i work closely with team rubicon who are a disaster response charity and the same and that man that i i love doing that i love doing it because it's that teamwork common goal greater good um and the variety and the variety and it's going to change and something's going to come 100%. up and you suddenly got that buzz it's yeah. like it's like being on operations 100 100 percent. and it's very hard to replicate that in other jobs yeah yeah and, but and i know i haven't deployed them yet hopefully will this year but even just knowing that there's a that chance there of well i can go and deploy overseas and go and help people out and get into like not a hostile environment but you know a, a not flipping london environment you know yeah absolutely um, so have you got your kit all laid out good to go mate i'm ready to you're ready <laughs> <laughs> the first thing i thought was i'll be able to put my aku's on for a decent reason yeah <laughs> not to go to the pub uh, and watch no, the rugby. Yeah, i know yeah um but going back so like a way maybe a way for people who are who are experiencing that i think I, I, i'm doing a shit i'm not i'm not doing what i want in life and that, but how do i do it because i'm in this job and it's sort of mature and i can't just step away from it it's just not people because people unfortunately jim don't have the flexibility well i didn't have the flexibility because I, I ended up going down the pan and then find myself right out now but some people just don't have, don't have that um flexibility to, be able to do it but maybe an answer is just okay carry on doing what you're doing just go, go get on with what you're doing in your, in your day daily life as, as crap as it is but try and do something on the side just something that's you know just something and I am going to say charity because it doesn't cost her anything to go and do. It doesn't cost, like Team Rubicon, for example, I talked about that because of my experiences. It doesn't cost her anything to register with them. I think you need to have a DBS check, but you do that in terms of the process. Yeah. And then straight away, you're part of that team. And most of them are ex military, run it. The CEO, funny enough, is a boot neck. <laughs> <laughs> he's, on the, he's on the, oh, you know him probably, Richard Sharp. Yeah, 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 I know Sharp. So try and do something on the side. Yeah, so Sharp little the podcast, going. Yeah, yeah I've Sharp in the podcast, mate. <laughs> Flipping renegade, isn't he? Absolute <laughs> renegade. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I was and Paul Godonis as well. Met Paul, yeah. And, he, he, no, uh, he, he's X216 officer, okay, yeah. Yes, yeah, so he's a trustee with two root con. Anyway, I digress. Uh, try and do something aside, yeah. I think I, I think you, you do make a good point that some people are locked up, tied into life in a way that that is difficult to achieve, especially when you've got responsibility and financial pressure you can't just decide right i'm going to go and take three weeks off and go and work as a volunteer for veterans or wildlife or for some sort of charitable organization but there are opportunities all around you you it's i think you've got to be resourceful you've got to force yourself to find new habits creating positive habits and um you know it's like a mental thought process you you have to work really hard to get in the groove to start something new to make it a regular habit it's like going to the gym in january after christmas it's the it's that hard stage getting fit again starting something new it looks like an it's the it's the one thing that's easy to put off there's always a reason not to try something but it could be as easy or as small as signing up to something you see in the local paper or here on the lo lo local radio station volunteering getting involved in organizations whether that's cub scouts whether it's even the you know the village fate you will end up meeting somebody and new doors will open that provide opportunity yep. you just don't know what, what what town or city you live in there could be you know the ceo of some private wealth management firm that ends up having his kids doing the same thing in the fate as you and you end up starting a new business but you'll never know if you don't change your routine open your front door and, and try something new after work or at the weekend so you know, I've always 
Or does that silly film with um, Yes Man trying to say, you, you know, you can't say yes to everything, but it's, if you get invited to something, go and just make an effort to speak to people. It sometimes feels like the hardest thing in the world to be in a room full of unfamiliar people and start a conversation especially someone like me who just generally hates people and prefers wildlife but I force myself to do it um, and that and that generally creates positive outcomes mm -hmm. so I think that's you know on a small scale for me it was different because I, I just mentally just could not cope with a regular job it's just not in my makeup and if you th starting back what we said at the beginning you know at 13 years old if my <laughs> two options were to go to RADA or the Royal Marines, Paris or Royal Marines. That's not your standard thought process for a kid. You know, I know I'm not capable of doing, and I admire people that do a variety of, of, of jobs that are uh, desk-based. But for me, I just have to have continuous interaction. That's, that's my personality, continuous ch change of environment. And I find great calmness in chaos, as, as strange as that sounds, but... I found um, operating in Afghanistan, I found doing, whether it was during the Arab Spring, um, being deployed to interesting locations, working on neo evacuation planning. To me, that is the, where I find the greatest fulfillment. And that is translated really easily into, into conservation. And so where I'm at now is um, I've kind of built this um, life, which is half, conservation with the charity which means um we're working on everything from fundraising so we're running around london trying to get people interested in what we're doing to actually being on the ground at the coalface training rangers advising on security plans introducing the latest kit and equipment that i know from my world specialist equipment that can help with um target identification or counter surveillance counter poaching surveillance trying to identify what's going on for me that's really that is just an amazing fulfilling thing to do and then the tv side uh pays better than charity uh, but it's uh it's also fun because you're getting paid to go to amazing locations and do activities that i love doing so on the last two shows that i've filmed i've skydived and dived in <laughs> locations that are pretty inaccessible or bloody expensive to go to so last year shark wreck one was filmed in the bahamas and we went to this remote shark island. wreck yeah shark wreck is the, the, the title shark wrecked um we went to bahamas and um, you know bahamas is not the sort of place you it's not like going to france it's not like going to calais it it's a it's expensive trip to go there and they hired a huge with two dive boats for us and we had cameramen uh, that worked on Blue Planet 2. So we're basically surrounded by the best shark scientists and camera people and producers. And I get to just, well, do what I want, survive in the water, or just um, be around these amazing animals. <laughs> and then the cool thing is, is that, um, you know, once it's produced, you start seeing snippets of the edit, you get excited, and then Shark Week happens. And that's just another whole phenomenon in America. Is, is it every week, Shark Week, is it? I wish it was. Is it every, <laughs> oh, no, every week? It's every week. <laughs> I every, year, a lot every, of year. <laughs> every year every year i'm really i like i'm a bit giddy i'm giddy. number 50 i came in i came in earlier i was trying to do the intro when the the sponsors before before this i just couldn't get my words out no like subliminally excited waffling more rubbish news no, anyway shark week yeah. is a, a year in the summer in america and it, it is a, like a massive institution there it's um discovery channel's flagship uh, show series oh. for the year so they put a huge amount of effort um into the production into the advertising but it, it's been taken on as a sort of national institution by the americans and there's shark week parties all around the country there's memorabilia there's t-shirts there's competitions there's festivals uh, it's unbelievable how how seriously they take this thing and the shows that do really well are, the, are generally the ones with the biggest fastest sharks great white sharks mako sharks but our one because it's this sort of survival show is kind of um a bit of a steve Irwin meets bear grills they're just just loving this like these these crazy this britain and Amer australian are happy to sort of hang around with these animals <laughs> but actually you know what for me it was actually not an easy decision to do that show one because of the danger but two i don't want to demonize these animals 
but what we've done is absolutely taken away well helped con con contrib contributed to taking away the stigma these animals are just mindless creatures that will kill you the second you fall in the water just not the case yeah i, I first <clears throat> i first started sort of i didn't yeah sort of realizing that a couple of years back with a, a lady i think she's greek so i used to work for blue abyss and there's a lady who's a big sport of blue abyss and her, her name is christina something and i saw a couple of videos of her and she'll get in a chain mail suit and dive down. No, Christina Zanato. There you go. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So I saw that. I've heard diving down, but she had she had uh, body armor on, buddy. Oh, you should get. She get, had some sense. You should get her on, on here because she is an absolutely amazing person. Now, what she does, the reason she is wearing the chainmail, is because she will go into a large number of sharks and she takes the hooks out their mouths. Oh, really? She physically sticks her hand down their throats and removes the hooks from long line fishing vessels. Oh my God. So she has built up this trust within the shark community. So the sharks know her and they've become literally become her friends. She so she robs their nose. She often puts them into um uh, a tonic state with the tonic in a in a immobility. So what that means if you flip a shark on its back, it goes to sleep. Right, okay. You didn't know that. Did you? <laughs> no. Yeah, so it has a thing. I never tried flipping a shark on its back. <laughs> well, I, I don't know why. You should <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't try this at that home unless you know what you're doing. But if you flip a shark upside down, it goes into a thing called tonic in immobility, and that put, it's essentially it's put to sleep. <clears throat> and what that allows you to do is uh, manipulate the animal. I don't think they know why sharks go into tonic immobility in terms of what what uh, it's evolved, what purpose that has. But they but they do. Uh, it might be something to do with mating. But in this case, uh, Christina, she um, she gets them in this calm state and they use they'll come up to her with huge hooks out the side of their face in their mouth and they seem to know that she will take them out uh it's quite a hard process but obviously if you're sticking your hand down a shark's uh, mouth you need the protection and they they you know she's in a she's amongst 10 20 of them so she wears um she wears the chain mouth but she's a bit of a, a legend in the in the the shark and underwater world because she's saving so many animals but what it highlights is um and this is another shocking statistic is that uh a long line fishing vessel the types that trawl the atlantic they will trail um 100 kil kilometers of long line so that's lines with hooks on and i keep i've had to look this um this measurement up a few times because i thought oh, i must be a k or 10k how can it be 100k you know that's that's here to Oxfordshire, that's London to Oxfordshire. How can we? And they do, and they've all got they've got thousands, tens of thousands of hooks on, and it's, they're they're trailing five or six of these things. So they're literally picking up every dolphin, every tuna, every turtle, every shark they can. They drag him and in, and they discard anything that's not valuable, so that dies, and then they they drag it onto the boat. There's no fishing reg, there's no regulation, and that's that's what we're trying to highlight. You know, people. She's on the the end of trying to. Th those are the lucky ones that got away those sharks, and she's she's taking the hooks out of the mouth. On the other side, you know, pe many people working to to show that you know we cannot carry on destroying all the life in the oceans as the populate world population grows, and you know we're rapidly heading towards nine billion by the year twenty thirty. How do we? But so, what's the argument for all that fishing? Food require food requirement. Yes, food. So how do we? What how do we? replace it how do we supplement it do, is it needed now or can we supplement it with something else well i mean it, it's regulation so that i mean uh, uh, fishing practices are incredibly damaging because if you think there's a lot of bycatch so mm -hmm. what you're, you're catching stuff and then throwing it away killing it and not actually using it so that's so that's got no so fit the practice of how we fish the types of netting um that we use so um gill nets which just catch everything they're responsible for um, the the extinction of the vaquita porpoise. There's only 10 left, so they will be extinct this year pretty much. Uh, that's because of gill net fishing in the Gulf of Mexico. If you catch everything, yes, you catch what you want, but you discard the rest. So that needs regulation. But it, that needs a force on the high seas. The oceans are massive and it's completely unregulated. Outside your coastal area <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in the, the ocean domain, there's thousands of pirate ships out there fishing illegally and then taking it to jurisdictions where no one's going to prosecute them so that's an issue there's regulation on the high seas 
international regulation of what what types of fishing um, uh, practices we use, and then quotas. You can't just keep taking from the same area again and again and again. And they say 1996 was peak catch. That was the year humanity caught the most number of fish. So the numbers that we're catching are going down, but the number of fishing vessels and the techniques and the sonar systems, the equipment we have to find them are going up. So if you think about that, we're better at catching fish, but we're catching less. That shows a, a catastrophe in stocks. So we do need to um, regulate. We need to create marine protected areas, areas that we don't fish at all. Uh, and we need a system almost like you have, you know, with farming, they, they have crop rotations that you rotate around so you don't um, completely damage the soil. There needs to be um, a form of rot uh, a rotation of where we fish uh, and then uh, catch limits. Now, to answer your question, uh, do we need to do that to feed world populations because fish is, um, provides uh, the protein for the majority of the world? Well, that's a whole other issue that there, re there is too many people. Um, <laughs> But there are other ways of feeding. You know, there is, an, of, as we know, an excess in the West um, and there's not enough reduced in some parts of the world. So, um, and I'm not, I am <laughs> no, by no means a socialist, but we do need to reevaluate how we, um, how we eat. Uh, and that can get us on to the topic of beef as well, because another issue, but it's specifically talking about um, fish, you know, we, we, um, there we are, humans are overcatching. And I don't here have the full answer of what we can do, but at least highlight the issue because if we don't do something it we are talking about um a catastrophe for the uh underwater world the marine ecosystems around the world well what's the what's the what's what is the impact being seen now since since we started worrying about it on on the underwater world what is the what are the what's going on so in <coughs> the caribbean shark populations have declined by 90 percent since the 1960s you are seeing extinctions of a, a large number of uh, different marine marine species. The other thing is global warming. That is obviously changing. Um, that, that that is reducing different types. So that's reducing food sources. It's changing behaviour of animals. But uh, in terms of the decline from industrial fishing, we're talking about whole areas that are basically like blue deserts. So when we talked about the USS Indianapolis uh, and the show that we filmed, um, the premise being that if you fell in the water in the 1940s or before that, you know, you had a good chance of seeing a dolphin, a whale or a shark. And probably because there were so many sharks and so much competition for food, they may well have been more aggressive or more likely to, to eat you. But if you jump in the water now, you really don't see anything. And actually on the, on the two shows I've just shot um, for, for Discovery Channel, uh, we had to work really hard to get any um, sharks in. There's a lot of chumming involved to get them there. They're not just hanging about. Um, they in, in in the Bahamas, it's a marine protected area, and you still don't see much else. As soon as you get a few miles offshore, you don't see much more than the oceanic white tips. So it really, there re there really re is a absolute um, disaster on our hands. Um, the statistics I don't have any statistics to sort of bore you with now, but um. They are really shocking, but it's just not something we're aware of. We're all aware of elephant and rhino numbers because it's a popular, cute animal uh, that is very vis visual. Stuff under the sea kind of goes unnoticed. It's not as fashionable. It's not as sexy to talk about, but it is, is, is as important as saving lions, tigers and rhinos. Mm, that's a good point. Out of sight, out of mind, I suppose, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah. I don't, I don't know... I don't think I, I think I spoke I touched on this before talking to someone um where we were talking about you know what you do with the food distribution of food like you were saying um and it, the only way that would kind of work if it may if it had any possibility of working when you say America or the West give the food to Africa to you know poor parts of Asia um is if everyone signed up for it if everyone agreed no chance. No chance. No chance whatsoever. And even then, if you manage to distribute it, right? So you start, you, like you say, somehow we've got equal distribution of wealth, food wealth, monetary wealth, if we need money anymore at that point, right? Someone will kick off. Someone will, not be, someone will not be happy. There'll be a nation who isn't happy. Yeah. And it'll just go pear ship again because, because we're flipping human beings. We can't help it. Um, but on the subject of, of the, the fishing, I think <clears throat> you're right. The, the oceans are so vast and so big, and 
you know, the international waters or the high seas, as you said. How do you monitor everything? Maybe that's going to be a maybe that's going to be a eye in the sky solution. You know, um, it's a good point. Yeah, I, I mean, the, working at Imos, like you'll have experience of how they they do monitor the the seas and the high seas. A lot of these are these fishing boats. They turn off their um, beacons, so you um, you can't track them. And when they do that, that means they're fishing illegally. And the other thing I found out is that a lot of these uh, vessels are actually crewed by um, uh, slaves. So in these really, uh, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. So you'll have these, um, so they say a Taiwanese registered ship, but they'll force, they'll advertise a job, and they'll take people out to sea, and then they never take them back, and they're. they're they are made to work at gunpoint. No. Yeah, there's a whole industry of slaves on board these ships at sea. It's a, it's a pretty vile industry, being stuck at sea for six months, twelve months on end. They get and then they they don't get paid. They've got no rights. There's no contract. It's a whole underworld that's going on there. It's um it's a pretty dark industry, but it's all part of this illegal wildlife trade network that um is is the fourth largest illicit criminal trade network on earth so you've got if you can think of what what are the illegal flows of money around the world that are huge you've got drugs cocaine industry huge uh, logistics set up financial um money laundering financial transactions going on there and then of course you know you've got the the source of where it's made and then the distribution networks and then dealers on the ground a massive network worth billions globally human trafficking is another huge global industry then you've got uh, the illegal arms trade and the illegal wildlife trade. So if you take uh, illegal fishing, if you take rhino horn, you take ivory, you t- take wildlife that's sold alive, so birds as pets, people sell bloody cheetahs and lions uh, all around the world, you add that cumulatively up. Uh, and hardwoods as well, cutting down rosewoods, different types of oaks. All that together, elite, the illegal trade it make, is the fourth largest network in the world is illegal wildlife. And that's something that I only heard that statistic last year. And I, if, I'm in work, if I'm taking active interest in the environment and I'm only really starting to scratch the surface of how bad this problem is, that's the same for UK police or Western security force, uh, police and security forces are only starting to wake up into how serious this problem is. It's mad, isn't it? The lengths of people, <coughs> the lengths of people who go to for that. Yeah. When I was watching, I was watching a video uh, on veterans for wildlife, and um, trying to think who's on it. Who's in that? Bunch of names. Bunch of names involved with veterans for wildlife. Uh, Aldo and Aldo was Kane it, and Jason. Uh, was it Aldo? I don't think it was Aldo on that one. But anyway, he's the one where they're going out and rhinoceros horn issue where you've got these rhinos. I can't remember which country it was, but obviously in Africa rhinos and poachers will come and just you know they, they'll 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 shoot the rhino just for the horn but half the time the rhino's not dead properly and they're hacking off oh it was horrible hacking off the horn of the rhinos well the rhino's still alive and they just yeah. leave it bleeding yeah they do but well whether it's still alive or not when they're hacking off either way it's flipping bad and um and one of the measures that i didn't realize was going on until i watched that one of the measures that the, um conservationists take now is they'll They'll dart, they'll dip, what you, what you call it, anaesthetize the, the, a rhino, you know, shoot it with a, you know, anaesthetic dart, whatever. That goes down, and then they'll take a chainsaw. Dehorn it. <laughs> yeah, and take the horn off while this thing's un- unconscious, because then it's not a target for poachers, which, it, which you think, awesome. But then you think, no, terrible. Like, it needs to be done, but it's so terrible that we have to be at that position to de. To 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 what's what's the word? Dehorn. Dehorn. You know to to maim and uh, not maim it. You know just flipping disfigure. There you go. Disfigure an animal to be, to help it keep alive. It, it was just it was horrifying watching it. Horrifying watching it. With it and the issue with that is it that does come at a cost. So the females, red males, they need it for protection and to compete, and they uh, the females need it to keep away predators when they're young. So they do need the horn. It has a, it's got an evolutionary value. That's that it's not just there for it to look good on someone's mantelpiece. And the other, the uh, what's worse than that is the the poachers. They track rhinos. These guys have incredible bush skills. And they'll track rhino for days. They come across one that's dehorned. They shoot it anyway. And I, and I heard that. I was like, why would you do that? And the re- the reason's very simple. So they don't track it again. 
because it's wasted their time. It's just that it's pure efficiency. So it's not a not proven method dehorning. What they generally say is a small reserve will dehorn <clears throat> because they're able to say, look, there there are no horns in here. There's no point tracking around in our reserve because all of them are dehorn. But on the big ones um, where you can't dehorn all of them, uh, it's actually fatal to a dehorn. So it's it's pointless anyway. So it's not there is no um, one stop solution for this comes down to demand humans are bloody demanding for things why do we want horns why do we want flipping rhino horns i know it's a it's a it's a seen as a a sign of wealth it's a desirable thing to have in in asia and and of course even though it's only keratin which is the same as our hair and our fingernails they grind it down and sniff it they grind it down and put it in these potions and drink it because they think it is a cure for cancer or it improves their virility all bollocks you know if you want to donate some hair and some of your toenails we can grind it down and send it to asia but uh they they may not good, <laughs> they may good not luck grind your, it, good your, luck grinding my toenails gin, down mate <laughs> <laughs> send your ginger locks out there oh, yeah, but man. it's exactly the same because it grows back the horn grows back um it is keratin oh, uh, so when you cut the horn off yeah, it grows yeah, back yeah it grows back so there's another issue here is that they'll now oh, blokes that farm them alive, hunt thousands of them. They just cut their horns off every two years. It takes two years to grow back. How long does the rhino last? 40. Well, that, that this, that I know you're going to go into. Why don't we have thousands and thousands of them and try and meet the... Because there's 1.2 million, billion people in China. We just... that we, we do not have the capacity to create that many rhino farms. Educate the Chinese, but and that is exactly what's going on. But it's it's a, it's a to change mindsets. It takes a long time. Think about yourself. Think about your parents and your grandparents. You know how easy it is it change to change your granddad's mind about something. Mm, yeah. Could you do you reckon you could get your granddad to support England in the rugby? Uh no, definitely Scottish. No, <laughs> <laughs> and he's dead. <laughs> well, that's when he was alive. Yeah, I think about think about you know pe- people when they when they are, they believe something so strongly they've been brought up on it. Mm. They don't. Oh yeah, absolutely. These young whippersnappers, these they see them as these lefties with these new ideas. They don't care. They don't care. They don't believe the statistics. Uh, absolutely, I believe. So okay. we kind of it's the younger generation, and there is hope, real hope in in, in the far east. On, on, on perceptions are changing, but that still leaves maybe four or five hundred million people who are not going to change their mind and still find these irons. As, these items are desirable. They want at their their wedding. They want shark fin soup. I mean, it's crazy, but it's seen as a delicacy. You, they you want mentioned to, Chinese. Are we talking more or less all about China? Yeah? No, it's got bigger in Vietnam. Okay, uh, Taiwan, uh, okay. Indonesia, but sure. it's, this is an an Asian thing. But we we ourselves are also. We, it's it's only in the last ten fifteen years that we stopped seeing uh, ivory and rhino horn as desirable. It, it it has been a part of our society. A lot of our ornaments have all those things in. It was a real um, sort of English noble upper class thing to go and shoot your leopard, shoot your rhino, and you have all that round your house. You know, so we've done it for years ourselves, but the numbers of British aristocracy doing that was pretty small. So the impact was minimal, and there were tons more of the animals. Flip that round now, <clears throat> so that there was so much less space for 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 these amazing creatures. In Africa, in uh, in, um, in in India, in in Asia, obviously you've got elephants and rhinos in Asia as well. Because of human encroachment uh, onto their land, there are there's less space for them to roam, so their numbers have have declined. Uh, we've taken a lot of their food sources uh, and killed a lot of them a lot of them off. So the ones that are remaining um, are now in even more demand because, as I said, the the, the numbers. Uh, who are demanding them in the in the in the east are huge, and they've got money nowadays. It's the uh, it's the second largest economy in the world. It's booming, and those people want these desirable items on and a and the demand out outstrips the uh, ability to supply it, which is why rhino horn is worth more pound for pound than gold or cocaine. Jesus Christ! It's a serious serious industry. Just, um, just ruining everything. Just ruining everything, aren't we? Yeah, Environment, well, conservation. Well, literally, all that's going to be left on the planet is a bunch of really sad humans 
going, where's everything gone? Do you remember the Matrix? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He goes, yeah. You're, just, you're just a play. That's probably the better option. What? To plug the Matrix, in. yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, I, I can't see... I mean, th- You've got to try and be hopeful because if you you've got to give people hope to to inspire them to to change their the way they they work or change the way they live, um, give people hope. Uh, but it it is hard when you do the maths on numbers on our requirement to we all want to live nicely and have good opportunities, we all want to have a fulfilling life and um, we all want to eat well, and we all want space and houses. But how how does that work in relation to coexistence with other species? Does that the numbers don't look too healthy um, when you look out to the future? Education, change values, isn't it? Change change the values, change what 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 you cherish as human beings and what makes you tick. But that you can't well, then you can't do that when you've got a society that functions on money. But there is, I mean, the the great thing about a uh, totalitarian dictatorship which is what essentially the, the Communist Party of China is, is that uh, if they decide to be conservationists tomorrow, they can stop the whole thing. And there are signs that they have made um, a lot of things illegal. So there is hope. If they, as things change, you know, whoever takes the reins next after President Xi um, could be, have a lot more. And they, under, they, and they recognise that there is a... a a human loss and not having wildlife, not just for mental health, it's nice to be outside in nature, but we need to feed. We need healthy ecosystems because that's what keeps us healthy. That is getting recognised. So there is hope in that respect that if big nations change, then then things will get better quickly. Well, China, if anyone, are up for taking radical decisions and implementing them, like you said, aren't they? And they, had the, they, had, they had the one child rule until recently, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, that's right, yeah. And that was it because they because they're getting too big. They only have one child. But then, but then, what I heard recently on another podcast actually was that one of the reasons they had to stop that rule is because families were having a a girl as their firstborn, killing them, killing the killing the girl because yeah. the boy was more valuable. Because over there, you, you know, it's um, you don't, you know, it's not quite e- e- uh, equal opportunities over there. Well, that is, it, it is the society is in balance in, in in that in that respect. But they've got a problem now. They've got an aging population. Oh, what, aging population? Yeah, that's, yeah. And that's catastrophic. For Japan's got the same issue, isn't it? Yeah, and that's that is an issue, which is why you know that's always about the argument for immigration in the West is that we've had a we've had generally an aging population. Like Russia is in deep trouble, uh, and they don't let anyone in uh, well, we, because of aging population. Yeah, they've got an aging population. Explain got, explain what the issue is with with an aging population. So issues. the more well the old oh you get me in my geography A level the, the, <laughs> you've asked me some <laughs> challenging questions it's like statistics here. so the issue with an aging population um, it, it's you know arguably it's very good for the planet but as a nation state um, old people aren't good at they're not productive in terms of creating wealth so that's less taxes they cost a lot to keep healthy to keep going so if you think about the nhs how expensive that is to run if you've got more people that are a burden which then older people have more ailments uh, to support uh, that's a cost so it means you've got less people earning the money or making the money and more people to look after so imagine you have one kid okay that'll be all right you have two right now i'm going to give you 15 to look after so dependents that's essentially the same issue that you'll have with an aging population of a country rather than having um, a balance where you have an acceptable number of old, young, and productive people uh, earning, uh, making re- revenue, and paying taxes. You've got a huge imbalance, which is why immigration comes to play. Which is in the West, we've kept our economies growing and we funded our uh, economy by having cheap, skilled, ma- um, mainly male dominated, uh, hardworking Eastern Europeans or different nations coming over here and doing jobs. Uh, to keep the economy going and supporting the upper echelons, the old, the aging population. Yeah. So that that's how we've got to where we are politically. You know, whatever the the state of crisis is at the moment, a pro for immigration. That's one of the reasons that we um, allow quite a lot of people into our country, whereas Russia doesn't, and they've got real economic turmoil. Uh, hang, no, hang on, I missed I missed the point you're making. Go back. What, what we, we the reason we let them in? That one of the reasons we let them in is because what? Irrelevant to aging population? Sorry, I missed yeah, that. Yeah, Britain 
uh, has had the same problem, not not as uh, drastically as as China or Russia is facing, but um, and the Germans are facing it too. They have an aging population, so to, in order to keep uh, the economy growing, in order to keep ourselves productive, we we allow um, productive people in at a certain working age, which is why we've allowed um, a lot in the Europe. The European Union model has been allowed to the Schengen model the freedom of movement allows labor to move uh, where it's needed so we've been good at creating jobs but we haven't had the people to do them that's why in the 1970s the germans allowed a lot of turkish people in it caused huge social upheaval but they did that because they didn't have enough workers and obviously there's a huge there's an economic uplift so it's a very economically positive to have lots of young people because they work hard but it uh, causes massive social division when those people don't have the same values same languages as you so there's a cost as well and that cost is usually felt politically but economically it keeps you growing but if you've got an asian pop <clears throat> and uh, very difficult to say asian aging aging population like mm. the, the, the population is also growing correct well, we're not saying the the age you're not saying they're dying older we're not saying that's not what we're saying that doesn't mean they're living longer it means an aging population. It's the demographic. It means so if you, I need to draw this on a sort of little diagram. But it means it's like a bulge of people between sixty and eighty. That should be narrow. And say a hundred years ago, people would, because we've advanced medical practice, people are living longer. But because birth rates have declined, we are having less children. So, so people, you know, I'm from a a, a a fairly traditional Catholic family, quite big families, five six people. But that's you know, that is not ordinary anymore. People have one to two, two point four kids. China, they had one. So if you had, you know, fifty years ago, people were having three to four kids. Those people get older. They get they're into their sixties, seventies. That's a huge number of people at that age. But we're supplying new uh, whippersnappers, less one ones and twos. So there's less productive people. So does that make sense? Yes, hundred percent. But then if that's the case. It's going to get to a point in two generations' time where it evens out again. Because there's old people, there's loads of those old people, older people, that bulge dies. Yeah, that's a population decline. Right. And that, yeah, that's, that's a decline, but that's a decline in your country's GDP. That's a decline in your, your country's military size because you don't have enough people. That, and and that, that's a good thing. I, for for the, the world, population decline is the only answer to all the issues we have like right now. Unless we start jumping on Elon Musk's crazy fucking rockets and going around into the stratosphere, into into orbit, and going into space and colonizing other um, other planets, we face two options: either decline um, gracefully and carefully, or colonize other other planets. But um, so I don't see it as an issue. But it is in terms of national pride and in terms of geo interpolitics, international relations. That's a massive issue. Mm. Russia. You know, the last thing they want is a smaller military. They they want a large <clears throat> GDP. You know, that is not that's that, not what Vladimir Putin signed up to having a welfare state looking after older people. Mm. So they're trying to encourage people to to breed. The same in China. They had too many people, but now they've got an aging population. That's not healthy for their military. That's not healthy for productivity for economic growth. And they want to be the, the world's largest economy. So put put aside. Yes, it, it's great for the planet. Less people. Eventually, and and actually, I asked Bill Gates this question at Chatham House, or was it Rusi? Um, you know, why on earth are we trying to create all these vaccinations for your? I don't know, it's a bit of a cheeky question. So, why are you trying to vaccinate people and keep people living longer? Surely, uh, that you know, illnesses are designed to, c to control the population. Surely, we should be educated even not to have many kids. Of which the whole room looked at me as they wanted to kill me. <laughs> but my point being is, is, you know, population growth is, is isn't healthy. Um, like um, when it's uncontrolled, but he, you know, he's done all the statistics and he sort of kicked, kicked me into touch. But he made the point that, but he believes I think it's twenty thirty five that all of humanity goes into a population to, will be going into population decline. We'll reach peak humanity. The problem is that could be between nine and twelve billion. Hmm. Why does he think it's going to happen then? Just because resources, whatever. As a country, um. We're going to go deep here. <laughs> so I like to go deep. Yeah. Yeah. So deep as, and nowhere where we were going to be wanting to talk about. No, we. I mean, 
never mind the fact that you were in the Paras and I was in the Marines. There's been zero banter. Come on, solving the world, mate. You fix the world no, on every is, other podcast. I think. I, I'd expect this is the, the Economist podcast, <laughs> the Spectator. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, um, why? Well, uh, as a country develops and people become richer, they, as a family, uh, they people want more resources. They want more experiences. They want to travel. 10 kids ain't good for traveling simply so people have less kids so it's a sort of natural cycle as a country's gdp grows wealth is spread population declines that's one reason for population de- uh, de- uh, de- decline the other is um famines or natural disasters cause people to move or war those usually are the, the three things that sort of put a halt to mass population growth right now though nigeria 180 million they're talking about it being the first country to reach a billion in Africa. Goodness me. Mm. How big is Nigeria? It's not very big, is it? No, it's big. Bigger than you think. If uh, what we need is an asteroid, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little one. This is the power no, coming no. out. <laughs> <laughs> which, How little? Uh, you, which uh, you can treat this as a rhetorical question if you want, which you will. Which uh, which area of the world would you hit with that asteroid? <laughs> career ending stuff <laughs> um, if it hits the sea and it causes a massive tidal wave it's going to sort of go multiple directions but you know you we you know we don't know as humanity um we don't know um what's around the corner no. the dinosaurs didn't bloody know no. Um, no. on the subject of the environment <clears throat> i was Try remember the guy's name now. Oh man, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it up while we're talking. I mentioned this the other day. I did exactly the same thing on another podcast. Bear with me. I do apologise. It's a it's a podcast about the environment. Joe Rogan's podcast, and the guy's name was uh not Peter Hotzel. No, who's this Joe Rogan character? I've seen him. That, he's got millions of listeners, hasn't he? Is he a podcaster? Eleven, eleven. I wonder where I got my inspiration. Oh, 11, million, 11 million downloads a month. I'm nearly there. And what do they talk about on his... Do, do what this does. Just talk shit. Whatever. Yeah. I mean, and it goes off in any old tangent. Yeah, anyway. It does anyway, yeah. yeah. Some of them have a, a direction, but not all of them. Not very much like this. Um, anyway, so this, this, this environmentalist guy. Uh, oh, he's a journalist. Um, long story short, he was saying that basically the... the, the, the not George Monbiot. Uh, I can't, I'll have a look after the environment but what we, we've done the damage to the environment from, from a global warming perspective that's all been done in the last 30 years basically the the, the stuff that is irre- no not irreversible the, the biggest damage we've done mm. in the last 30 years yeah and through working out we've only got another 30 years we need to basically become as a as a as a world we need to become carbon neutral or extremely close for the next 30 years otherwise we're fucking doodle dandy. The the um the 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 global temperature is set to increase by a, by two to four degrees. It's gonna go to two degree, one point nine something. It's gonna increase by that much. What are we in? Twenty nine. I think it's by something like twenty thirty five, twenty thirty mm-hmm. something like that. And that that means if it increases that much, that means that for example, uh, Bangladesh was given the example, very low, um, very very low lying. You know, close to sea level, um, gone. Bangladesh will be gone. It's like almost guaranteed. It's all those people, what happens? What happens? You're yeah, right, in, right in Wales, though, aren't you? In the valley. <laughs> yeah. Fair right summers. Wales, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm all right, Jack. I'm all right, Jack. Yeah, but no, because then we'd have loads of flipping English, wouldn't we? English. <laughs> Englanders coming over with their footballs and that. Yeah. And they've, and gobbing off about the 2003 World, Rugby World Cup. Why don't yeah. they move on to our mountains? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's true. You'll be the last salvation. Yeah, and you're right. And but um, why, why about predictions in that when they don't turn out to happen? It's like the boy that cried wolf, and like when well, no one believes you anymore, it's like the millennium bug. Everything's you have to believe them though, otherwise we don't go. Any, we don't get anywhere. Yeah, we, and, we, and then we get a, a thirty years time. We go flipping heck. Well, he was right. And then you're, <laughs> and then, then. And you're coming down to Penavan or Snowden, <laughs> Snowden to join me in yeah. my yeah. mud hut. There is. I mean, uh, we. If you were to invest money in property, it probably wouldn't be in a ski resort now. Mm. Unless you're massively into hill walk, mountain walking and uh, mountain biking, 
Mm. But it, the the world is changing, and you know, I can swear when I was growing up, um, firework night had snow in November. I swear I remember snow in November. What, every time? Well, not every time, but just a few times. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're getting 20 degrees now. We're getting some seriously late summers or just continuous, like February. The other day, we were walking around in t shirts and shorts. Mental, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> I loved it. I do, I do enjoy, I, I'm, yeah, ginger, I'm ginger, but I'm like yeah. a day walker. Yeah. I really enjoy sunshine. Day walker. Yeah. I, I'm immune now. I don't get sunburned or anything. Um, unless I take my top off, pasty white, and that's it. Anyway, yeah, no, you, no, you're right. I, I, I think I, I remember it being like that. Well, no, I definitely don't remember like your Indian summers and and crazy January, February, March weather. I'm sure at the end of January is around in a t-shirt, knocking around in a t-shirt. I'm sure of it. Mental, up and down. Um, yeah, the weather's the weather. The weather's the other side of it, you know. And how, how is and, that, and again so well there's your, there's your population decline you go with your weather it gets warmer crops are a nightmare to grow and then you've got interstellar haven't you what's that not seen the film no oh my god you haven't <laughs> lived <laughs> really no mate great greatest sci-fi film ever made one of them it's, really it's, yes honestly get your box of kleenex out it's hideous anyway the premise of it is at the start of it like there's been a I think there's been some crazy um, uh, solar flares. Solar flares. Yeah. There we go. Solar flares and. They do cause the, issues, yeah. Yeah, and the dr- dramas, uh, all crops are dying off and just can't do anything. And it's like, right, we need to do something. It's like getting off the planet. Watch Interstellar. Brilliant. But I'll tell you what, th- th- so bring it back on track. Come well, on, li- link it back to sort of military stuff and conflict, which we're, we're familiar with. Yes. Um, yeah, go on. Is global warming, in my view, will cause world wars, regional wars and world wars in our lifetime. And I think... They're happening now. Well, they are, absolutely. And, that, and you know, the Syrian crisis is uh, uh, in large part to do with climate change. Uh, the same with m- refugees coming out of uh, Libya or everything from Egypt, uh, Sudan. That's movements of people. That's creating conflict. But I think, you know, that is just... That, that's just the canary in the coal mine. It's, uh, it's about to get a whole lot more serious in the Middle East. Um, big movements of people, droughts. That's going to be um, part of the focus of uh, what what could be could light the match of the next next conflict. But I think in our lifetime we'll see a world war. And the reason I say that is um, um, the the generation that lived through the Second World War, or especially the ones that fought, are, are pretty much dead. Um, so the corporate memory of how horrendous it is is non-existent. Secondly. We in the West don't think it can happen. We we think we we can legislate or we've got these global uh, organisations that can stop it happening. But there is constant war uh, in the Far East and Middle East. There's always there's, at the moment about forty hot conflicts around the world. So there's this, this belief that one it can't happen. There's a huge proliferation of weapons and capability, uh, especially with cyber terrorism being able to shut down whole grids, ele- um, whether that's electricity, whether that's um, water immediately create uprisings as a result of that um we don't know where it will be but i think we've lost the corporate memory we haven't prepared ourselves for it and there is too many people for the resources and so what we're now in 2019 the last one was in 1945 i think somewhere focused in the middle east the far east there will be a conflict way bigger than the one that's happened at the moment between uh, the, the civil war in syria that spread out into iraq i think epicentered around there could be uh, like we had in europe that 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 major conflict over divisions you've got those divisions those fault lines in that part of the world that could be uh on the cards and you know you and i we want to be wearing our granddad slippers and uh sat by the fire but i don't think it'll be that easy uh, no. when we're in our 70s i really don't no i, I agree with you. i was watching um a few years back now i was looking at uh, i came across it it's called the Isaac Asimov something anniversary debate or That's discussion. Sci-fi. No, no, it was a, it was a, it was a, a panel of okay. flipping brainiacs, right? <laughs> you had um, you had like NASA people on there. You had uh, oh man, D- um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the sort of the people's the people's scientist on there, cool dude. And one of the people you had on there was uh, a, a former. Secretary of State for Defence or a senior general 
in mm. the in the US arm or US forces, right? The the senior general in the US forces. I can't remember his name. I can't remember his position. And the topic of debate was water. Yeah. And it was potable water. And this crisis is going on where there is one of the impacts of global warming, the, and arguably the most critical, that people aren't realizing is global water, uh, global water, po- the availability of potable water. And the general true man, ex general true man, said, there will be, he said, there will be, and this is a, 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 um, a strong feeling that the upper echelons of US military not, and other Western powers that the next world war will be soon. And one of the catalytic one of the catalysts for it will be potable water. He said there are there are there are micro wars, micro conflicts going on in Africa now between several states. It's over water. Because what a country upstream and let's say the flipping Nile, upstream, uh they need to divert more water because if water's you know, potable water's running out, they need more water for this, that, or the other, for drinking water for irrigation. So they're diverting more water up, upstream to, to better their economy and their agricultural economy so the the downstream of the country next door they're suffering because there's less water getting downstream so their economy is suffering and they're going to war with each other these micro conflicts he said in the states so again this is a few years ago he said in the states there are at least four he said 45 or 48 states in the middle of lawsuits with each other for the very same reason, yeah. because upstream estate is taking more water off it because they need more because there's less in the, there's less in the environment and it's impacting other states. It's, it's, and his opinion was next world war is going to be water and it's going to happen soon. But all these things and all these things like dams are automated. They're online. So what happens? The hackers open the gates or change change the nature of that hydroelectric facility. There's all these things that are going to come into play in the future, and we've got more weapons, more potent ones. Um, who knows? All bets are off. But, uh, you know, it goes back to the old, uh, the Welsh thing, isn't it? You've got plenty of water in Wales. It's a good advert, this, for uh, moving to Wales. Yeah, I don't know why we stop charging people to come in. Well, maybe you need to build a wall. Maybe you need to... <laughs> <laughs> and England's going to build it. <laughs> yeah, and we'll build it. England will England pay for it. Yeah. This could make Wales great again. It could make... It could... <laughs> <laughs> who, who would be Trump in Wales, though? Who would be... I don't. We haven't got anyone. Well, that's like that. a rugby player, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be. Uh, if Neil Jenkins could grow his hair, he's got like a wispy ginger hair, isn't mm. he? Grow that big be the a wig. It's a wig anyway. Stick a wig on there, Neil Jenkins. Do you know what, just you, you com- must be happy uh, after to have the fiftieth podcast and have Wales win the, the Six Nations. The Six Nations. Very happy. Very happy indeed. Going, but again, we're fucking on rugby now. Just do you know what makes me sad when I watch the Wales games and. Neil Jenkins, right? He has to wear it because he's on the part of the, the team, not the team, the, the support, whatever. But he's a water boy, and he has to wear a water boy high vis vest and says H two O on the back. And all I can think is that film Water Boy. Remember it with Adam Sandler. <laughs> I think Neil Jenkins, legend, reduced a water boy on the pitch. It makes me makes me really sad. Makes me really sad. Uh, <laughs> Right, what have we not covered? We got we got ten minutes left. Like, right? what have we not covered that we intended to cover? But um, we talked a lot about the environment and the world, a bit of World War, and um, a bit about life leaving the forces. But we haven't done anything about. Well, you have to come on again. The most defining part of my life is the fact that I was actually <laughs> in the Royal Marines. Uh, you did uh, three tours of Afghan. That's right. Yeah. Which ones did you do? I did. Uh, well, I was there in two thousand. I assume they were Herricks. Uh, well, one wasn't, but um, I did two thousand six, seven, eight, um, and eleven and twelve. But because oh. I, I managed to sort of span, I didn't. My second tour was an eight month tour with Armour Sport Company Vikings, the vehicle, the Viking vehicle. That was absolute carnage. That was a real tear up. Um, the first tour was in uh, Herit Four, which was the tour uh, where the powers went down south, and we were up in Kabul. Um, not doing a huge amount compared to the boys that went south, but um. That was that was uh, two thousand and six. I did the really interesting thing about the Afghan campaign, which I'm reading about because I'm uh, making notes and researching to write a book about Afghanistan. Ah, oh, you mentioned this, yeah, go on. Because Afghanistan is now Britain's longest modern war, and it is the United States' longest war ever. And if you look at the result, uh, it's not looking too good in terms of what we've come away with and what we have achieved. 
And the reason I say this is that in 9-11-2001, um, obviously the World Trade Center was hit, and it was hit as a result of a plot by Al-Qaeda, masterminded by Osama bin Laden. He had uh, embedded himself with the Taliban in Afghanistan. He had a force of about 2,000 uh, Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, and they were welcomed there by the, the Taliban, and they would fight together. They were fighting the Northern Alliance. They'd almost completely... Uh, taken over the whole of the country and then he sort of does this um mm. operation and basically you know pokes america in the eye with salt and vinegar and you know they're pissed off and what happens special forces with b-52s and the cia palm all the hell out of al-qaeda and the taliban in the mountains in kandahar and bagram in late 2001 and by december 2001 al-qaeda is pretty much defeated in afghanistan they run away into different parts of the globe into pakistan and the taliban capitulate by december 2001 so if you look at that time frame september to december pretty, i'd say mission accomplished but they did what they needed to do was deny that space to the two al-qaeda five years later we are increasing troop numbers to try and uh, stem the rising insurgency from the Taliban they've got themselves sorted again they have re-established themselves and al-Qaeda started to re-establish itself in East Af eastern Afghanistan you think what the hell happened between 2001 and 6 how do we let this happen when we were you know initially quite successful and one of the reasons is we invaded Iraq complete sideshow you know we took on two competitors like going to a boxing match you know knock the guy down Whilst he's down for the 10 count, bringing in a bigger opponent and fighting him as well. And then the other guy gets up and then you're boxing two people. Mm. And that's what, that's what happened. So by the time that you know, Paris Marines and the, all the rest of us went back in force in numbers in 2006, Taliban had years to sort themselves out, refinance, retrain themselves um, using the Pakistani ISAs, safe, haven, safe havens in Waziristan in the federally administered administered tribal areas in Pakistan. They they're ready. It took our eye off the ball. Absolutely. And so then all our stories, our operational tours and, and the many people that you've had on this podcast, you know, we were fighting a force that was quite capable and that wasn't even the main effort. In two thousand six to what, maybe two thousand ten, well two thousand nine at least, Iraq was the main effort. <laughs> Would it not potentially, <clears throat> let's say Iraq never happened and we stayed and we we were deploy more troops to Afghanistan, if that was what they intended to do, or, or would or would have done? Would it not have descended into the kind of counterinsurgency that we were doing in terms of sex onwards anyway, just an earlier stage? Because going because uh, and would it not be a, a flipping a pointless exercise anyway? Because going back to something you mentioned on early on the podcast with. Um, we talk about environment, conservation, Asia, changing mindsets, and ch you know how hard it to teach your granddad to change, change his mind, and you know support England instead of Wales. But you can't do that in three generations, four generations. You need hundreds of years. Mm. You know, and this is something I've spoken about before, but I think I definitely feel with Afghan is that you, you do to genuinely get that country to to where we want it, whatever that whatever that is, and whatever it's right for us to think we want it at. Mm. Taliban gone, look, let's live like a democracy and just be a bit better at living and help you guys crack on and let me leave you be Afghanistan. Hundreds of years, I think, there. Hundreds of years. Because it's not like it would be quicker in a Western country. Better better forms of communication, better education, better um, uh, bigger picture awareness, you know, on, the, on, on an individual level. Don't have that in Afghanistan. You don't have that in Afghanistan. Well, this is what's interesting, doing the research into the country and i suddenly think i suddenly realized you know i knew nothing about the country when i went there <clears throat> we weren't taught what the place was about the culture nobody even at the highest echelon the higher the, the top commanders in britain did not understand afghanistan the different ethnic groups and it's only recently that i realized that you know when we talk about defeating the taliban what that what does that mean what you mean is you have to get rid of all the pashtuns in the south because they are the taliban and there were different types of Taliban. There were hardcore Haqqani-based Taliban taught in, taught by the ISI in Pakistan, the real um, radical Islamic ones. 
and there are ones that have sympathy but w w would have been happy back in 2001 2002 to go into a joint government with the Hazaras, uh, with the Tajiks, with the Uzbeks, with the other ethnicities in Afghanistan, because it was once a united, peaceful country in the 60s. So it did have that capability. But if you send a, for a force of foreigners there and you start blowing shit up like we did, you just piss them all off. And we call them all Taliban. Well, they are more naturally going to sympathise with Taliban leadership than they are with the US or the British, who, by the way, have been there in three other conflicts and had three ding-dongs with them. We're not popular in that part of the world. So, the, you know, and we can't sort of just get through discussing all this now, but it's it's so much more complex than I think we ever realised when we deployed, when we were trying to patrol our little area, our area of operation, and talk about handing out blankets and doing hearts and minds in these med caps and then dropping a 2,000-pounder on a sniper and killing like three or four people and destroying all their crops, you know. I don't think we really uh, knew what we got ourselves into at our level, but also at the, the most senior levels of the British and American armed forces. And right now, um, it's, you know, British and Americans' longest war, 2.7 trillion spent. The, the numbers are pretty frightening, over 4,000 British and American uh, deaths, military and contractor deaths, around 50,000, was it more, 50,000 civilians. Uh, and the Afghan National Army are now are losing two and a half thousand dead a month. Jesus. Yeah. Mate, that is frightening numbers. Yeah. This and is it's... another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you leave that to the end, you moron? <laughs> we were talking, I'm not, you were not talking gonna, about the environment. not going to blame myself, am I? <laughs> <laughs> Jim. It'd be, uh, oh, hang on, no. What, mate? Fame, uh, shameless plug what do you want to so wh how can people get hold of you what should people watch out uh, yeah. next well, yeah thanks very much so, you got my socials at J.A. Glancy the sort of chatting about the environmental stuff I'm doing and then um, the TV show the next one on Discovery Channel Shark Week comes out in July that'll be Shark Wreck 2 with myself James Glancy and Paul DeGelder and then I've got a few other TV projects in the pipeline nothing to be confirmed yet and of course as I mentioned I am doing the research just to to talk about um, doing a book on Britain and America's longest war. We'll def we'll definitely have to come back on and talk about it. Definitely come yeah. on and talk about that. Excellent. Mate, thanks so much for having me. No, absolute pleasure. Cheers, Jim. Cheers, man. Perfect. <laughs>